we are back at the Urology Care Podcast. I'm going to let my guest introduce himself now. I'm Matt Nielsen, a urologic oncologist at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and I'm pleased to speak with you today about uh, Urology 101. Yeah, that's exactly what we want to go into today. We're just going to break it down from the absolute beginning. So just tell us, what is urology? Urology is the branch of medicine and physiology concerned with the function and disorders of the urinary system and the male reproductive system. And how does how does it affect? The urologist is the uh, medical subspecialist who takes care of a large set of conditions and diseases uh, affecting everything from newborns and children to Mm -hmm. young adults, older adults, and uh, men and women. Okay. And the urologist really is the go-to specialist for a lot of very common conditions. Urology is is a unique among the specialties in that there's no corresponding medical subspecialty. So, for instance, a patient who has uh, gastrointestinal symptoms will Mm -hmm. often be referred to a gastroenterologist. Sure. And a gastroenterologist is an internal medicine physician who had extra training in the subspecialty of gastroenterology. And that physician will perform procedures like colonoscopy as a common one and some other types of procedures with scopes and things like that help work up and medically manage and diagnose patients with some conditions. But if there is a specific, more complicated problem identified, they would then hand off uh, the care of that patient to a colleague who's specialty is surgical training. Okay. Uh, Often in the colon cancer screening instance, for for example, a gastroenterologist may do a colonoscopy, find a colon cancer, and then refer the patient to a colorectal surgeon uh, who would in turn treat that. In contrast, with urology, there's no corresponding medical subspecialty. So if a person sees their primary care physician and has a urology-related complaint Mm -hmm. that can't be simply managed um, by the primary care physician, they'll refer to the urologist who will do the initial diagnostic evaluation, often medical treatment, often diagnostic procedures with scopes and things like that, and then for the patients who ultimately require surgery, will perform that surgery. Okay, so it sounds like a urologist might build a longer-term relationship with the patient. Is that sound accurate? I think that's uh, very accurate, and for me personally and for many of my colleagues in urology, I think that's one of the unique aspects of the field and the specialty that attracts many of us to the field and and keeps us happy uh, in our our profession for a long time because those relationships with patients are really meaningful. And for a general urologist, what would be some of the most common conditions that they would see? Common conditions a general urologist would see are urinary complaints and symptoms like um, uh, urgency, frequency, difficulty urinating, uh, urinary incontinence. Kidney stones are very common. About 1 in 10 of the general population is affected by that, and it can be a recurrent problem. So that's a, a large part of urology practice. And then there are a lot of cancers that affect the urinary tract in the male genital system. That's my own area of expertise. Okay. And uh, really among adults, it's about 25% of all cancer survivors in the U.S. are survivors of cancers that affect the urology system. Wow. So uh, just for an example, to go back to the kidney stones, would would that mean a urologist would diagnose the kidney stone and then also perform the surgery? Yeah, for the kidney stone example, uh, in some cases from the very beginning, the urologist is involved in the patient's care. Uh-huh. Uh, if it's uh, not as urgent, uh-huh. they, they will often you know see their primary care physician and get referred mm-hmm. to urologist. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes kidney stones can present in a more urgent way. And so sometimes sure. it will be initially detected in maybe an emergency room setting, but the first person that's called once there's a question of stones is the urologist. And what parts of the body does a urologist treat? The urologist treats the urinary system and the male reproductive system. So the urinary tract is the system that creates, stores, and removes urine from the body, and urologists can treat any part of that system. That includes the kidneys, the organs that filter the waste out of the blood to produce urine, Mm -hmm. the ureters are the tubes that connect the kidneys to the bladder. Sure. The bladder is the hollow sac that stores the urine, Mm -hmm. and the urethra is the tube that the urine goes out. And also the adrenal glands are are glands uh, located above the kidney that are often uh, cared for by urologists. 
and those those uh, urinary tract organs, we are the specialists who manage those for men and women. Okay. We also treat all parts of the male reproductive system. Okay. And so um, the penis is the organ that releases urine and carries sperm out of the body. The prostate is the gland underneath the bladder that adds fluid to the sperm to mm-hmm. produce semen. And the testicles are the two oval organs in the scrotum that make the hormone testosterone and produce sperm. Sounds like there's a lot going on and a lot of things that a urologist has to deal with. Let's just start. How long does a urologist have to go to school for to to be able to do so many things? That's a great question. And it differs a little bit in different countries. But speaking to the, the sort of typical pathway for the United States where I work and have trained, Um, The typical pathway is to complete an undergraduate degree and then after that go to medical school, typically four years and four years. The residency training in urology is minimum five years Mm -hmm. uh, after medical school. So when a person graduates from medical school in the U.S., they are a doctor, Mm -hmm. but all MDs subsequently do some extra training and sort of an apprenticeship supervised model with experienced physicians in their specialty. The length of that training differs by specialties, but urology, like many surgical specialties, is a minimum of five years, and some people will have additional years built in for research. Okay. And then some urologists per- pursue even more additional years of subspecialty training after residency. So um, that's called a fellowship. Yeah, yeah. And uh, many of my colleagues will tell their patients that you know, we spent 10 short years after college learning how to become a urologist. And, okay. and I think that that training helps us bring people up to, to really become experienced in the field. Sure. At the end of training, urologists obtain certification in the specialty by taking written and oral examinations administered by the American Board of Urology. Okay. But we really never stop going to school because medicine requires a commitment to lifelong learning. Mm-hmm. And fortunately, the AUA has provided great resources all along the pathway for this great resources for medical students and online curriculum, career yeah. career development ed- yeah. and continuing medical education uh, publications, and a lot of great programming like we're enjoying here at the annual meeting in Boston. Absolutely. And going back to when you were in your medical school days, what was it about urology that attracted it to you when you were a medical student? Yeah, I really, um, coming into medical school, had no idea what urology was. I had a grandfather who was a neurosurgeon, and I sort of thought coming into medical school that that might be something interesting. And then uh, when I saw neurosurgery early on, it didn't really uh, feel like a good fit for me. And so uh, I thought maybe I'd go into a medical specialty. Many of my mentors, especially early in medical school, were oncologists or cardiologists. A lot of the teachers in the early years of medical school were in that realm. And so I sort of thought maybe I wouldn't go into a surgical area. And then in the last two years of medical school, we spend time rotating. Mm-hmm. Everyone rotates on all the different services. And I did my surgery rotation, and really, it really clicked in terms of you know feeling like surgeons could really do something to fix problems and, and, yeah. and, and really sort of help people in a different way. And when I met my urology faculty, I saw that they were able to not only do uh, interesting procedures and work with interesting technology, but develop long-term relationships with their patients. And and that combination to me made it obvious that urology was a perfect fit for me. What type of healthy measures can people take that is beneficial to their urologic health? It's a great question, and patients ask us that all the time. It differs uh, a little bit for specific conditions, but in general, uh, some of the best evidence that we have is that following generally healthy habits, uh, have eating a balanced diet, getting exercise, quitting smoking if you're already smoking, not starting smoking if you haven't yet, mm-hmm. um, and uh, maintaining a healthy weight are actually sort of across the board habits and, and lifestyle uh, factors that can help improve and reduce the risks of a lot of different urologic conditions. You mentioned smoking, so I want to follow up on that. What kind of consequences it's specific to urology health, does smoking have? Uh, smoking is the major, what we call modifiable risk factor associated with the risk of bladder cancer. What does modifiable mean in that sense? Modifiable meaning uh, for a person who is male, they have a higher risk of bladder cancer. Uh-huh. Uh, another factor that, that increases the risk of bladder cancer is age. Uh-huh. But those are things that we can't change. 
sure. we're sort of, sure. you know, we're out of our control. Th- that, that's out of our control. But modifiable risk factors are risk factors where depending on choices that we make, we may be able to increase or decrease our risk. Okay. And so for bladder cancer, about half of the cases that are diagnosed are associated with people who are either current or former smokers. Okay. So people who smoked in the past but may have quit still have an elevated risk, but fortunately they actually still benefit from their quitting smoking to the yeah. extent that their risk of recurrence of bladder cancer is lower. Okay. So patients who are current smokers diagnosed with bladder cancer can still benefit from smoking cessation. Got and it. for people out there who aren't smoking yet, this is sort of one more reason not to. Smoking cessation just means stop smoking. Exactly. And there are great programs and uh, some of them including medications and other things to help support people who have uh, become dependent on nicotine. So who might someone find in a typical urologist office besides the urologist? What what kind of team is that? Yeah, we're lucky in urology to really have uh, been sort of early adopters of team-based care. And um, most urology offices will have nurses, and um, the nurses uh, often have a very specific expertise and advanced training and experience with procedural aspects of urology, different technology and equipment that's used to do procedures in the office. And uh, and some of those nurses actually go on to get advanced practice training to become nurse practitioners. Physician assistants are also another advanced practice provider like nurse practitioners who have an increasing role in urology care. Okay. And many of them work close with physicians, but ex- it, it work in a way that uh, expands access and, again, have a lot of expertise to manage some of the common office-based conditions in urology. Some offices also involve nutritionists mm-hmm. to sort of help uh, patients with some of the lifestyle habits that can, could improve their care and their outcomes. Mm-hmm. And in uh, some settings, there is multidisciplinary care with physicians from other specialties that are relevant to the care of the urology disease. So for instance, there are some medical specialists who did an internal medicine residency and a nephrology fellowship, and they do the medical management of kidney diseases, whereas urologists do the surgical management. And so for some patients, for instance, with kidney stone disease, they can be helpful to try to prevent recurrences and and, and manage patients uh, to to prevent uh, that from becoming as much of a problem as it sometimes can be. In, In my world, in oncology, We work very closely with our medical oncology colleagues and radiation oncology colleagues. And so physicians who treat with chemotherapy are the medical oncologists, and the radiation oncologists are physicians who did training after medical school to learn how to use radiation technology Mm -hmm. to treat cancer. And so depending on uh, what a person is going to urology for, they may see some of those people, um, but but we definitely have embraced team-based care in urology. This kind of goes back to our the beginning of our discussion, but what would you say, in just your own opinion, is the main difference between going to the primary care physician and seeing a urologist? So the primary care physician, uh, whether they're a pediatrician, a family physician, or a general internist, mm-hmm. really takes care of a whole universe of health, you know, body systems and yeah. health issues, and um, within the urinary tract and male reproductive tract, there are a lot of really common conditions Mm -hmm. that are often managed well by primary care physicians managing um, urinary symptoms with medications or uh, simple urinary tract infection Mm -hmm. management. But for many common urology conditions, particularly any that require any sort of procedure or advanced diagnostic testing, um, it is often the case that a primary physician will refer to a urologist as a physician whose full focus is on the urinary tract and the, and the male reproductive system. Okay. And I'm just also curious, what is a pediatric urologist and when would a, someone need to see a pediatric urologist? When would you know your kid needs to see a pediatric urologist? It's a good question. So there are a number of common conditions that um, affect children that will lead to a need to, to meet with a urologist. Um, Some of these are found um, commonly in our country now. Women who are pregnant will have ultrasounds uh, before the baby's born, and there are a number of common conditions that are 
variations in the development of the kidney and upper urinary tract that can be seen on the prenatal ultrasound before the baby's born that may raise some questions. And so there are some families who may be having conversations with urologists before their baby even gets there, yeah. uh, or certainly shortly after they get there. There are um, some more common conditions that uh, are not detected until after the baby's born, maybe okay. in the newborn nursery. So for uh, baby boys, uh, one of the things that they check in the newborn nursery is that mm-hmm. both of the testicles made it down into the scrotum. It's very common. Very common that yeah. that, that that may not be the case. Yeah, and yeah. Um, it's not an emergency, but it's important to get a urologist involved to evaluate sure. and see if, if there's something going on there. Also, there are some common conditions uh, for baby boys where the... Um, the development of the urethra, the tube in the penis that drains the urine, um, had some different variation, and that can be another reason to sort of check with the urologist. Sure. And um, and then there are some relatively uh, rarer, but uh, not not unheard of conditions uh-huh. that are more complicated variations in the development okay. of the urinary tract, um, like bladder extrophy and some things like that. And Absolutely. so so there are a number of conditions that. Um, that a pediatric urologist can get involved with. I just want to wrap up by asking you, you know, what's the most rewarding part about being a urologist or just being a physician in general? I'd say the most rewarding part of being a physician in general is getting to know people well, helping them through a problem that sort of lands in their lap and, and trying to help them you know, make good decisions and navigate mm-hmm. the options and then do whatever we can to try to help improve their outcome. For urology specifically, I, uh, I think that the opportunity to develop long-term relationships with people yes. is great. And yes. in, in my specialty in oncology, while some cases can you know, be very aggressive and difficult to take care of, many people can have great responses to treatment and have disease that we can manage and then take care of them in the long haul. And uh, to me, that's a very rewarding thing. Thank you so much for coming on today and doing the podcast. It was really fun to to, uh, get a chance to talk with you. Yeah, thanks. This has been great. This podcast has been brought to you by the Urology Care Foundation, the official foundation of the American Urological Association.